All right, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Josiah Neely. I am the Energy Policy Director with the R Street Institute, uh, which is a free market uh, research organization that advocates uh, market-based solutions uh, to climate change and other environmental issues. Uh, we're here to talk uh, today. I think the official title of this was the problem with climate policy or whatever. Uh, but we're specifically going to be looking at a couple of different uh, possible responses that have been put forward uh, for the issue of climate change that are market-based and that are designed to uh, appeal to people who like markets, conservative folks. Um, so in, in the hot seat, we have uh, Peter Brin of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, and then we also have uh, the couch. Uh, 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 and uh, Peter uh, is going to advocate uh, in favor of uh, carbon tax with a fee and dividend as a solution. And then uh, on the couch we have uh, Rob Sisson of uh, Conserve America, uh, Rod Richardson of the Grace Richardson Fund, and uh, Travis Bradford. Bradford of Columbia. Um, who are going to uh, offer their own perspectives, both on the carbon tax and then also talk about a little bit about an alternative uh, approach, uh, clean tax cuts. Um, so let's start with you, Peter. Uh, lay out what is the case for uh, carbon tax as a, a response to, to climate change? Sure, thanks, Josiah. So um, thank you all for coming. The, Probably the place I want to start is actually as part of my introduction. Uh, my before I was a Citizens Climate Lobby on staff, I was actually with Exxon Mobil, and that's where I became a believer in the approach of what's often referred to as a revenue-neutral carbon tax. Uh, and the reason is that if you look at the seriatim of policies that have been put forth to deal with the climate issue, we we often frame it as there are five ways to price carbon. We like to say. Uh, there's the do-nothing approach, and we've done a pretty good job of that for a really long time. Uh, don't do anything about climate change, right? Uh, two is the EPA regulatory approach. Um, you know, you could cynically call this the Band-Aid approach. We're going to fix this industry over here. We're going to do some renewable fuel standards over here, some energy efficiency, uh, you know, index over here. So that tends to be very inefficient. It can drive improvement for sure. Uh, but it tends to be very inefficient and really gets the government in the business of regulating the market. The third option that we've seen is cap and trade. That's the idea where you sort of put a cap uh, on emissions and you distribute credits throughout the economy and those that need to buy them, you know, do so and then you, you have this whole trading scheme underneath that. That had a promise to be pretty market-based, at least on paper. Uh, some of the challenges with it, though, is it became very complex almost every time it's been attempted to be implemented or has been implemented. It's turned into a very complex policy, oftentimes with uh, different forms of um, uh, credits and swaps and things like that that offer opportunities to game the system and complicate things. Uh, and the other big challenge with cap and trade is price uncertainty. So you don't know, you have to model what you think the price will be 5, 10, 15 years out. That leads us to our fourth option, which is a, a carbon tax. And the idea there is you just put a straight fee on carbon emissions, actually a tax. And the reason I discern between the two is when you say a tax, that generally means money that stays with the government. So you say, okay, if you want to emit carbon emissions, that's fine, but we're going to put a fee on it. And what that does is it sends a clear price signal to the marketplace that that activity is going to get more expensive over time. If you want to keep emitting CO2, that's okay, but it's going to get more expensive over time. Well, we know that markets respond to price signals and we expect the market to adapt. So that would be very effective at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and it's good for business because it's predictable. Problem with a carbon tax is A, it generates a heck of a lot of revenue and all that money going to the government is not very popular amongst uh, a lot of folks in the country. And because we're not trying to create a new revenue source, we're just trying to reduce emissions. And two, um, the, uh, the, if you do a carbon tax, it's, it tends to be very regressive. So it leaves low and middle income households behind. So how do you take the good parts of a carbon tax, i.e. the market-based approach where it lets the market find solutions 
and counter the downsides to it. And that leads to our fifth policy option, which is what's a, known as a revenue neutral carbon tax, or at Citizens Climate Lobby, we have a version we call carbon fee and dividend. It goes under a few different names. And the, the fundamental idea here is you do the carbon tax, but then you take all the revenue that's raised, you don't let the government keep it, you send it back to the economy. And there's different ways to do that. Some advocate for a tax swap, so you lower corporate taxes and personal income taxes and do put a fee on carbon instead. Or what we advocate for is you do a dividend check, so you literally send a check to every household on a monthly basis. Again, that gets rid of the revenue uh, issue, so we're no, long, no longer talking about sending more money to the government. Second of all, it deals with the low- and middle-income household issue because you're now protecting those low- and middle-income households that otherwise see their cost of living go up. Um, so I, I think what I agreed to is just kind of frame the conversation around that. There's another interesting idea that's emerging, and the folks on the, on the couch are going to talk about that. But that kind of gives you, hopefully, kind of a, just a policy overview of where climate policy has traditionally been uh, in the past. And with that, I'll hand it over to, to Rob. Okay. Or, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Travis, I think uh, what I'm saying is you, you might have... Uh, some skepticism mm -hmm. about uh, carbon tax as an approach. So, yeah, uh, I, I have a bunch of them actually. I've been taking notes. I haven't been, <laughs> I haven't been tweeting. Um, so, uh, no. In general, I think we all agree that that the market needs to price uh, this externality, this uh, emission, this pollution. Um, the um, and and we need to figure out what kind of pricing mechanism and what kind of price levels would be appropriate. So my. The, sort of the criteria that I, I think about, and this is where, you know, we can point to the failures of the cap-and-trade regime, and there, there are many, there, by the way, there are very good examples of cap-and-trade, right? So uh, uh, the, um, uh, you know, all of the uh, ozone-depleting gases were uh, managed under a cap-and-trade regime. It turned out to be a very cost-effective way of, of dealing with that particular set of problems. Um, sulfur uh, um, uh, uh, oxides also had a variation of this theme and, and saw a great deal of success. Now, those are, while very difficult and challenging problems at the time, uh, they were simpler in the fact that they had a narrower set of uh, chemicals and, and, and insults to the environment that needed to be addressed. They could be easily put, be put a wrap around them, and we had actually an emerging set of cost-effective alternatives that could easily displace them. So the circumstances were different. It was a simpler problem. But, but I think that the problem where cap-and-trade and carbon taxes and all of them fail are um, there's just it fails on a number of criteria. So to be effective at a price, to deal with a global commons problem such as climate change, you have to do a number of things. And so, you know, one of them is you have to cover all of the emissions. You can't just cover some of them. And that's clearly where, you know, kind of the Copenhagen or the Kyoto Protocol and the Copenhagen uh, 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 attempt to correct that and the Paris has sort of completely ignored uh, a number of sectors by, uh, and by, by hoping that individual countries will sort of aggregate up to the right level. But, the, um, but, but you, it doesn't matter which regime, regime you use. You have to make sure that you cover all of the emissions, not just the rich wor wor world uh, emissions and, and exempting the poor ones. Um, the, um, it has to, in effect, be binding, meaning that, that you can't uh, allow for an, some of the emissions to sort of escape in different routes. And, and, if, and this, again, it's sort of the counterpoint of covering all of them that's really important. The other thing is, is whatever price you establish has to be high enough. And so one of my, and this gets into where, well, I'll get to that in a second, but you have to make sure that the price is binding enough that it actually alters the capital allocation of decision, decision of people who might be investing in carbon emitting assets versus those that uh, achieve the same result without emitting carbon. And, and the last thing that it has to do is that it has to be something that, um, that can't necessarily be passed on to the end consumer as simply a tax and not alter their behavior, right? So if, if in fact, you were able to, to put a carbon tax on some car something that is carbon emitting, and, the, those, uh, and, and there was no alternative to that carbon emitting asset for some period of time, then that's not a carbon tax, that's just a tax, right? That's just a straight tax on folks for their behavior. And some of these behaviors are actually very critical to welfare and livelihood of the individuals that uh, uh, you know, that may need these energy services or other, other uh, agricultural services that have carbon emission. So this is where I sort of, I have an issue about a carbon tax. It, it, to meet all of those criteria, right, every mechanism that you mentioned is going to be challenged, 
um, because it's tough to do all those things. My concern is, is that in particular, a carbon tax um, is challenged specifically on um, the issue of whether you could ever set a politically feasible carbon tax high enough to actually change, alter people's behavior. I think, you know, we saw this when, when you had a price for carbon through the, uh, through the, the uh, European climate exchange, the, the, the price of carbon was in, at the end, in, when it first launched, uh, it, it, it instantly went up into the 40s or, you know, in, into the 50s and the, uh, and, and Germany was very concerned about sort of a failed program out of the gate and so just issued a bunch more permits, right? So whenever the carbon tax gets too high and, and especially if it's compounded by tough economic circumstances, people will come in and try to correct that and all of a sudden you never get a price that's high enough that actually binds or changes people's behavior. So I think carbon taxes, uh, because they're so visible, they affect, um, uh, they're, 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 they're susceptible to that uh, issue. The second reason that I think that they fail the basic test is if you want people to do more of something, then you want to provide price certainty. If you want people to do less of something, I actually argue that an uncertain price is probably better, right? Because when you're investing in capital assets, and I thought you, you actually mentioned it, you used a term that I really liked. It was, uh, yeah, price uncertainty. Um, as one of the mechanisms. So in this way, a, a, a clear carbon tax actually does give businesses and consumers the ability to make a change. But again, if they can't, if, if it doesn't bind their behavior, if they can pass that through to their end customers without altering their investment patterns um, and therefore their emissions patterns, then it doesn't really, um, uh, then, then it's not very helpful. What you need is you need sort of the, the Russian roulette of prices, right? You need the most extreme and uncertain price you can come up with because you're trying to deter people from behaving in a certain way. So what I would say, you know, so, so, so in that way, I think that the cap and trade program, because of the uncertainty that it creates, um, that if people aren't responding well enough that the future price of carbon may, may skyrocket uh, and, and affect the economics of their project, actually creates a bigger impediment than a very clear carbon tax that they can easily figure out a way to pass through to the consumer. So, I, it, it, I, I, while I, I think if you could get any of these to match, to, meet, to, to do a good job across all the rules, that would be great. I just think that carbon taxes in particular um, are easier to sort of find ways to circumvent without actually changing the carbon outcomes. All right. Rob or Rod, which, uh, you both have mics. You so. want to go first, sir? I'll go first because you're, sure, I'm part of yours. Um, th thank you, Josiah. Um, so we've been looking for some kind of pragmatic solution to carbon emissions for quite a while. And the carbon tax has been discussed since the failure of the uh, cap and trade legislation in 2010, 2011. Um, but we, we see some pragmatic political issues with that. Um, number one being a Grover Norquist. Uh, in, this, in the short term, because the Republicans control Congress, uh, they control the White House, and Grover controls that pledge almost, I, I think, all but maybe two Republicans have signed. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we began meeting with some Wall Street analysts that work on risk analysis for capital markets. And they came to us and said, you know, we, we, we view climate change as a huge risk for the people we're doing analysis for, and we need to figure out some way to address this. Um, and over the course of a year, we, we worked on a different modeling. Uh, suddenly we saw the state of New York, the state of Illinois offering massive subsidies, taxpayers writing checks basically to support nuclear facilities in those states because of the way the energy markets have been working. Uh, so we arrived at this concept, okay, we agree that a price differential is very important to send signals to the market. But how do we accomplish that and get around the political hurdles that we see in the near term? And we came up with the idea, well, rather than putting a price on carbon, let's remove the price from zero emission energy. Uh, that would be nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, biofuels. Um, I, I don't want to get in, a, I can't get in the weeds because it, it's kind of over my head. I'm not an energy sector analyst. but. Let, you know, energy companies are regulated by their state regulators, and um, in exchange for a monopoly or near monopoly, they're guaranteed a certain return on their capital. And let's just say that's $100,000. Um, 
Well, it's not, it's not simply a matter of saying um, uh, the, the income tax on that's 35 percent or 135, it'd be $135,000 gross revenue. You have to continue to gross that up so that after the company pays taxes, their return is $100,000. So in, you know, in general terms, uh, it'd be like $160,000 a, regu a regulatory uh, commission would allow a utility to earn on their investment in order to net $100,000. So we're not talking just a uh, you know, what we think of marginal rates that we all filed our taxes last week, it's much larger than that. So a couple of the a key policy things are, uh, so we set that price signal by cutting the taxes on zero emission energy. And the way the regulatory markets work, because utilities are given that quasi-monopoly or actual monopoly, uh, they, they're not free just to sell the electricity at whatever the market will bear, whatever they can get from people. Their rates are set by regulators. Regulators are going to come back to them and say, hey, wait a minute, your costs have gone down substantially now because you're not paying taxes on that revenue. So you need to lower your rates that your consumers are paying. So in the, in the, um, the carbon tax model, fee and dividend, the government collects a tax and then decides what to do with it. Um, and I think there's, I think the last election demonstrated there's a big distrust out in America of what Congress would do with that money. Um, with, e even though they might offset our personal taxes or business taxes or send us a check back, they may decide in a few years or the next Congress may decide to do something else. So our model where we're cutting, we're, we're removing the taxes from clean energy, um, it translates immediately or very quickly into rate reductions for consumers. So consumers keep that difference in their pockets. And if you, you can imagine your electric bill, um, for low-income homeowners, electric bills a much more substantial portion of their monthly budget than it is for members of Congress, let's say. And so it's, the impact of that rate reduction is going to be felt most acutely by uh, low to moderate income households, so that's good. And then utility companies have to maintain capital investment plans with their state regula regulators. And the state regulators then are going to start pushing them, hey, this if you do more zero emission energy production or shift to more zero emission energy, you're going to get a better deal, drive more, more stable, su sustainable, affordable energy to your clients. And so that's our, that's our answer right now that we're pitching. And I, I think the, the best thing is we have two members of Congress currently working on drafting legislation on that. So we hope to have, we have report language that's been filed, uh, was filed this month, last month. And we expect to be able to have legislation in committee by the end of this year. So with that, I'll pass it over to Rod because right. our proposal is very similar to what Rod's working on, uh, but Rod, sure. much bigger picture. Well, <clears throat> I don't want to miss this opportunity to bash the carbon tax, so I'm going to start there. <laughs> <laughs> so how many folks in the audience know who invented the revenue neutral carbon tax? Does anyone know? Okay, well, I'll tell you. The revenue neutral carbon tax was uh, not invented by an economist. It was invented by Professor David Gordon Wilson of MIT, a expert in gas turbines. Uh, he uh, has several uh, patents in advanced gas turbines. And that explains a lot about the uh, revenue neutral carbon tax. It is an excellent, brilliant, creative idea that would work really well if the economy worked like a gas turbine with machine parts that were perfectly regular and, you know, precise so that you could stop the flow of, of capital uh, to fossil fuels, which is what you're trying to do with a carbon tax. You're trying to discourage the flow of money to these enterprises. However, the problem is, is that the economy is not like a machine. It's much more organic. Uh, it's much more like trying to uh, plug your finger in a hose, okay? Your finger is squishy, okay? And it, it's not a perfect shape. So the water spurts all over the place and you get wet. That's, that's economic distortion, that's friction, uh, and that's elasticity. And that's exactly what happens with a carbon tax. Because with a carbon tax, you have a lot of elasticity. People will uh, not necessarily change their behavior when you tax carbon. 
they will accept a much higher tax uh, you know, to keep driving their cars, to keep heating their homes. It may have a little bit of effect, but you really have to crank that price up. You're trying to get a substitution effect, and at the same time what you're getting is a lot of negative effects that you don't really want. Uh, price effects, inflationary effects. Uh, you are, in fact, uh, you know, it's, it's not only regressive, but it hurts business. You drive some businesses out of business, perhaps, bankruptcies, unemployment. So in order to correct that, you have to do some complicated things. Uh, you know, and one of the problems that I have with a carbon tax is, you know, I'm a supply sider. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm well aware that supply side economics was oversold. Uh, when it, it, it initially came out, they oversold what it could accomplish, how much revenue you would get back uh, from a, a tax cut. Well, to me, I think a lot of the carbon tax advocates are doing exactly the same thing. They're overselling what the uh, policy can accomplish. Uh, and, it, you know, they're saying this is the only efficient way to do it, it's the most efficient way to do it, and it's not quite the case. Um, it's overselling it. and, and so to understand why, you know, one of the best carbon tax proposals out there was put out by Arthur Laffer, uh, a supply sider, and uh, he, he looked at it and he said, okay, well, consumption taxes have that elasticity to them, and so they, um, you, you know, you're, you're going to not have that much of an effect, impact on growth there. You will with the capital income taxes. You'll have, so if you, if you trade off capital income tax cuts for a carbon tax, uh, that's a good trade because that should help economic growth. Probably the best model. But the problem is, is that when you have such a big stream of income that's coming into uh, the coffers of the government, even if you're intending to pass it through, it engenders political debates about what to do with it. And suddenly you have proposals like fee and dividend, and, and then you have the climate justice folks saying, well, no, we got to spend it on this program or that program. And pretty soon you're spending it in ways that don't make up for the economic impact of the carbon tax. So that, you know, really the only responsible way, I think, is the Laffer proposal would probably work pretty well. Fee and dividend, I don't think that that dividend will have the, the same impact as the cut on capital income taxes. So you're, you're risking uh, economic problems. But, you know, to me, the, the real problem with a carbon tax is the problem with all climate policy. I mean, all climate policy up until, uh, say, 2015 is based on an, an assumption which has changed. You know, something changed in the market. There was a big change from 2011 to 2015. Wind and solar both became cheaper than fossil fuels, uh, according to LCOE. It's levelized cost of electricity. And what that means is that all previous climate policy is really based on the assumption uh, that was true 10, 20, 30 years ago, that these clean solutions would never really be able to compete with fossil fuels. And so you needed a price adjustment mechanism. You needed some sort of uh, way of controlling the preferences of the consumers. So either you had subsidies or regulations or a carbon tax. All of those are ways to control or adjust price. But in fact, that's no longer true. And it's going to become increasingly untrue that you need a price adjustment mechanism because those things are already cheaper. So what you need instead is capital acceleration. You need capital acceleration to clean solutions. So what we're trying to do at the Grace Richardson Fund is pioneer a new set of policies that looks precisely at capital acceleration directly at clean solutions. So we think that there's an opportunity to bridge the partisan divide uh, between conservatives and progressives on energy by introducing a policy called clean tax cuts. Clean tax cuts is the application of Ronald Reagan's supply side tax cuts to the problems of energy and environment and even climate. Because it's really all a matter of supply. Supply of greenhouse gases and pollutants 
versus the supply of clean solutions. So any supply side economist would tell you if you want more of something, tax it less. So, and if you really want a big effect, the most effective taxes to a target, as Arthur Laffer pointed out, uh, in terms of growth, are capital taxes that investors pay on debt and equity. So you can have a big effect. Um, and indeed, we have pioneered uh, you know, this uh, concept through a series of charrettes, uh, which are a, a tool used in architecture, uh, where they design a building or something like that. This is a suggestion from Amory Lovins, who was at the first meeting when we uh, first announced this about uh, it last June. Uh, Amory, who uh, is part of the Rocky Mountain Institute, had been using these charrettes for energy efficiency. And he's been itching to try these for public policy, I think, and I was the likely guinea pig. So, uh, so Amory uh, and Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, Grace Richardson Fund, and the Sabin Center for, uh, at, at Columbia University uh, held the first charrette, charrette in se September. And a bunch of really smart people showed up, like Paul Walker from Conserve America and Travis uh, from Columbia. Uh, and they all ripped the idea apart and put it back together again and targeted it in some very interesting directions. Uh, Travis decided to take on the uh, green bond market uh, for, for the next charrette at Columbia. And indeed, we've just been through a, a series of seven more charrettes targeting this idea at different areas of the economy. Uh, uh, in addition to Columbia's work on green bonds, the Nature Conservancy took on uh, the um, uh, farming and forestry. Uh, we had the University of Colorado take on um, uh, oil and gas. Uh, Arizona uh, State University take on clean tech. Uh, R Street Institute took on transportation and did a great study on how CAFE could be turned into a positive uh, reward mechanism using clean tax cuts. Now, just to give you a quick flavor of how these things work and how they can accelerate capital and change behavior, the R Street Institute uh, proposal is probably the clearest example. Um, that, that, you know, this was a, came out of a suggestion from the first charrette. David Parham from SASB pointed out to us, hey, if this is going to work anywhere, it would be transportation because you have really, really clear metrics. You know what's clean. So uh, we have CAFE reporting. Okay, we know the average vehicle fleet efficiency of every manufacturer, so you can take that one number and turn it into a tra tax rate if you want to. I mean, you could do things a little bit more complicated and refined than that to take into account vehicle footprint, you know, but basically, the higher your vehicle fl efficiency, the lower your tax rate. And that can drive the entire automobile industry cleaner, and if you apply that at the level of the taxes that the investors pay, then just think about it for a second. Every single person on that board of directors, all of the key management, the executives, all the employees probably have stock packages, right? So suddenly their packages get more valuable, the more sustainable their companies become, okay? And that R Street idea is a very clear example not only that, but the, the more sustainable the company is, the lower their cost of capital. Okay, that means that they have a competitive advantage over their, their, uh, their competitors who are less clean. They, we are accelerating the more sustainable, more efficient, less wasteful companies. Uh, and that's really almost exactly the same idea that, that uh, Paul Walker and Rob Sisson came up with in the utilities, if you reward the utilities uh, for the amount of, you know, with a lower tax rate on the amount of zero emission energy they sell, they have an incentive uh, to change their behavior, especially uh, my suggestion to Paul was to apply those taxes at the investor uh, level last night mentioned this to him and he said, yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, so, so uh, that, um, but you know, it's, it's not just something that you can do on the equity side. That's a very, two very clear examples of how clean tax cuts would work. But on the bond side, what Travis did uh, was really actually the killer app, uh, I think, because 
Travis, uh, you know, said to me, Rod, you know, yeah, you're a supply sider, and yeah, I get it, but you know, you're missing the boat. It's not all equity side. Uh, it, you know, what you're really doing on the uh, on the on the you know is when you apply these taxes, you're bringing down the cost of capital, right? You look, and especially if you do this on the debt side, on bonds, for instance, two or three percentage points off the cost of capital, which you can get through tax rate reduction, means 20 or 30 percent cheaper, clean energy. Okay, and he said he wanted to do the the uh, green bond charrette uh, because everything else I was looking at, transportation oil and gas, power sector, they're all supply and clean solutions, but they are on the demand side of capital. In the bond market, you're on the supply side of capital. So you can have a really powerful supply side effect. So when you, when you let's, let's think about what that looks like. One of the best suggestions that we had from, from Travis was a, what he calls an herb, which is not something you smoke, it's an energy reduction bond, zero emission energy source bond issued by a corporation or, you know, possibly by a bank if they're doing uh, loans for, uh, you know, uh, rooftop solar and bundling those loans, something like that. Corporation, Apple, Walmart financing their operations for, uh, you know, uh, uh, solar power for their uh, uh, data centers and their stores and things like that. Okay. You're creating a new class of bond. It's halfway between a muni bond, which is a $3.7 trillion market, and a corporate bond, which has a higher rate of interest, and that, that's a US corporate bond market is $35 trillion. So this new kind of bond, right, it has a lower cost of debt for the issuer. The issuer cannot find any money cheaper than this bond, okay? It's a lower cost of debt than anything else they could do. So it's very attractive to the issuer. For the investor, it's a higher tax-free interest rate than anything else they could get, right? Because it's a corporate tax-free bond. So the corporation is going to have to pay a little higher tax rate than a municipality. So that's very, very attractive to the issuer, too. So that kind of instrument has the potential to be in the trillions of dollars because it's arguably more attractive than a muni bond, more attractive than a corporate bond. So the potential of these things to, to quickly, rapidly expand financing for these things is quite enormous. So I you know, suggest that capital acceleration is where we want to be now, where you want to go. And I while I am a tremendous admirer of David Gordon Wilson and his creativity, uh, and while the clean tax cut idea owes an intellectual debt to the uh, carbon tax, and no doubt, uh, you know, this has been influenced by the fundamental insight uh, of, the, um, of the carbon tax is that you do need a tax differential of some kind. Uh, I would submit to you that the carbon tax does it on the wrong side, that really it needs to be done on the capital side. You need to accelerate the capital. You need to have the tax differential over there. And instead of having a negative feedback loop, which creates friction and political opposition and leads to, well, the election of maybe Donald Trump, uh, you need to have a positive feedback loop that people can buy into that's a reward-based mechanism. So we like to stick to positive feedback loops. Uh, I know Travis here no longer beats his students because he's realized <laughs> that negative feedback loops don't work very well in education. And, you know, yeah, it's frowned upon. And positive feedback loops work very well. Well, you know, if we consider the problems of, of and the environment and of energy and of climate, to be a public learning project. Maybe we can understand why positive feedback loops should be preferred. So Peter, uh, I'm going to give you a little time uh, for rebuttal. 
Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's several, I think, um, uh, critiques of uh, carbon taxation are offered there. One uh, big one, of course, is a political uh, one, is that, you know, however the thing might work in theory, uh, you know, it's just not going to happen politically. Uh, and then also, um, there was some discussion, for example, of, you know, well, even with the tax, uh, people are still going to be using uh, fossil fuels or other sorts of emissions. Um, uh, so, so maybe I'll, I'll give you that. And then also, if you want to just, you know, compare from your perspective, uh, kind of the pluses and minuses of carbon tax versus uh, this clean, ta uh, clean tax cut concept that, uh, that Brad is talking about. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I have to say that I was unaware of the, the history of uh, where revenue neutral carbon tax came from. I know a lot of people who support it. I uh, was unaware on the history, and given that I'm a fellow engineer, it explains why I support it. So that makes sense. <laughs> So now, now it, it, I understand why I was drawn to it so quickly. Um, the, the other thing I would just want to say, though, is I don't view this as an either-or approach. Um, you know, I, I know for purposes of debate, you're supposed to take a side. The reality is I see merits in both approaches. Um, uh, you know, the, the clean tax cut is, as Rod said, in some sense is a mirror approach of a, a carbon fee and dividend. But I will defend, as best I can, many of the claims that were made because I think that they're fair concerns and ones that come up often and they do need to be responded to. Um, and so I guess, you know, in thinking about this discussion we were having today, I said there's probably three fundamental questions that I would ask about a climate policy, whatever that policy may be. One, is it up to the challenge, i.e., is this something that's going to really get us where we need to be on emissions? Now, that's not to say that there's a silver bullet that's going to solve every problem. There are you know, millions and millions and millions of decisions that have to be made throughout the economy, but is this going to be the thing that pushes all those decisions forward and gets us where we need to be? The second question I'd ask is, is it good for the economy? Because if it's not good for the economy, it will be pulled back. It has to be something that is good for the economy, A, because we want to, we want things that are good for the economy, but also B, because uh, if it's not good for the economy, it probably won't pass in the first place, or if it does, it'll be repealed. And third, and this is somewhat an extension of the last comment, is it politically feasible and does it have staying power? So to address those three fundamental questions, actually, may maybe it's worth even stepping back again, because I kind of gave a whole seriatim of climate policies before. If I'm going to defend a carbon fee and dividend or carbon tax, I should, again, describe what it is. Our proposal has three fundamental planks. It's a three-legged stool. One, you put the fee on carbon. We like doing it upstream because it's simple. Upstream, I mean, you do it for oil and gas. You do it in a pipeline network. For coal, you do it somewhere between the mine and the end user. You're talking in the order of a few hundred ratepayers in the economy who would have to pay the fee. It's incredibly simple to administer. So that's one very attractive thing. So you put the fee upstream. Now, again, as I said before, that sends a signal to the market that the emissions of, of the product, once you use it, those emissions are going to get more expensive over time. So marketplace, adapt as you see fit. So that's the first thing. Put a price on carbon. That sends the signal that we should emit less. And as a believer in markets, I believe that that incentive will work and reduce our emissions dramatically. Two, the revenue to return. And as I said before, we, our proposals, we send that money back to households in the form of a dividend check where every basic, it basically works out that every citizen gets the same check. It's, it's an equal share per, per citizen. Um, and the third aspect is what we call a border adjustment. The idea there is that if you're trading with a country that does not have a comparable price on carbon, then you want to either do a tariff or a rebate at the border to make sure that you're keeping your manufacturers and your jobs here in this country, you're not just sending emissions and jobs overseas. Now, the reason I go through that is because in responding to a lot of the, the, the comments and concerns and criticisms that were made, it's, it's useful to have that basis. Um, so so one, one comment that was brought up is, you know, it, it's got to cover all emissions, all sectors of the economy. I agree entirely. That is why if you apply the fee upstream on the three dominant sources of greenhouse gas emissions, coal, oil, and gas, you will easily get the entire economy. You don't have to worry about what is the carbon content of producing this pen. I don't have to run around with a, a, a big accounting scheme to figure out the carbon footprint of this thing. 
I just put the price upstream and I let the market work and that price will trickle through. That's the beauty of a free market. Prices are priced in. So price it upstream, let that price trickle down. Um, so in that sense, yes, it does cover just about the entire economy. And, and I will compare that to a clean tax cut. Again, it will have a good impact. One of the challenges in my view of a clean tax cut is you're not doing this sector by sector by sector approach where you have to figure out, let's figure out the band-aid or the approach or the, the thing that we're gonna lob onto the side or the taxes we're gonna cut in each industry. Frankly, that, that gets, in my view, gets very complicated very quickly. Um, I mean, you're still working it, so maybe not as much as I think, but a simple fee apply upstream seems much simpler to me than that sector by sector approach. And it's equivalent to all sectors, so you're not picking on one industry versus another. Um, a question was brought up about rich world versus poor world. That's very true. We don't want to take an action that's going to disadvantage the United States. That's exactly the point of the border adjustment. It's to, but actually, there's two points. One is to protect uh, American industry the se and jobs and emissions and, again, s prevent them from going overseas. The second uh, reason you do a border adjustment isn't, isn't really because you want to implement a border adjustment. It's because you want to send a price signal to our trading partners that we've taken the step, it's your turn. Because what happens is as soon as we put that fee in place, if you're India or another country without a comparable policy, you're gonna do the same policy at home to avoid that tariff altogether. So really, yes, it's a protection to, to level the playing field, but more than that, it is a signal to other countries. But it does make it a no regrets policy because if we act and another country does not, we're, we're, we're balancing for that at the border. Um, okay, so that, that's, th those were some of the responses to, well, I don't know which category that fits in. I, is it up to the challenge? Ah, yes. So is it up to the challenge? The, the question was brought up of, um, well, people will just pay the fee, right? People are just going to pay the fee. And, and some, some products are less, uh, more elastic than others, meaning that uh, gasoline could go up 50 cents a gallon. People are going to still probably use about as much. There will be a modest decrease in use, but about as much, uh, you know, whereas other industries, people will pull back significantly. Well, that's the point, right? That's the point. If you want to have the greatest impact on reducing emissions, you want to put your money where you're going to get the greatest bang for the buck. I don't want to spend a million dollars making the auto fleet more efficient if I can get a much bigger bang for my buck in another industry. If I can spend that same million dollars in another place and triple the amount of emissions cut I get, well, great, let's do it. That's the free market. And so from a market perspective, I want the market to figure all that out. If we put that price signal on emissions, the market's going to figure out the cheapest place to get the biggest bang for the buck. So you're right, elasticity for different products is different. That's the genius of a carbon tax. It allows the market to, to work that all out. Um, and, and we continue to raise that fee. It is true, if you don't get the fee high enough, you're not going to have a big enough impact. That's absolutely true. Here's one difference between a clean tax cut and a carbon fee. With a carbon fee, you can continue to ramp that fee up as high as you need it to be to incent that behavior. With a carbon tax cut, you're going to get down to a floor and you can't go any farther. Once you get taxes down to zero, you can't go any lower. So will it have an impact? Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, right? <laughs> so look, I'm, I'm off of the carbon tax cut, but I do think it has a limit in how far it can go to reduce emissions. Now, that all dances around the, the, the last, uh, uh, the, um, well, uh, two, two other things. Good for the economy, politically feasible. Okay, is it good for the economy? A carbon fee, the way we've proposed it, revenue neutral carbon fee, where you send money back to households, actually can be stimulative to the economy. Now, I didn't believe that at first. As, as, in fact, I didn't expect that. We had it studied, the result came back. The reason is this. As I mentioned before, if you send money back to households in an even basis, and a lot of studies have confirmed this, about two-thirds of households either break even or come out ahead because, yes, my cost of living maybe has gone up $50 a month, let's say, for an individual this month uh, because of the carbon fee, but now I'm getting this check for $100 a month. There's about two-thirds of households where that's true, where they break even or come out ahead. And those two-thirds of households, by the way, tend to be low- and middle-income families. And that's where discretionary dollars are needed the most. They're the folks who are going to go out and spend it in places like healthcare, retail. These are job-creating industries that create a lot of local jobs. So that does a few things. First of all, it means it's good for the economy. Second of all, it means that this policy has staying power. A tax cut has staying power, too. Don't get me wrong. Clean tax cut would have a lot of staying power. If you cut people's taxes, it's going to stay in place. But if you start sending a check to households, you do not want to be the politician found sticking your hand into that pot of money and trying to divert it to somewhere else. That's going to be a very popular program. 
Um, so I, I think unlike some other carbon taxes where you're not basically re returning the money to the people and they can't see the benefit of it, it has staying power. Um, I, there's, there's a number of other things. I, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. The only thing I will say, though, just, just to wrap up, because I don't know if I'll we'll have time to say anything else, I'm glad you all are here. And whether or not you're convinced that a carbon fee or a clean tax cut or any other policy is the right way to go, the fact that we're having this discussion, I think, is helpful. The fact that people are thinking about it is helpful. The fact that we're talking about market-based solutions is helpful. And what I would encourage is if you are not, if you're concerned about this issue, our main objective as an organization, yes, we do support a policy, but we also support Congress acting. So I would encourage you all when you get home, send your member of Congress a note and say, I want you to act on climate change. It's an issue for me. I'm concerned about it. I like carbon fee and dividend. I like clean tax cut. Whatever you like, that's fine. Just that's the important part is that we act and we start moving on this issue. All right. uh, Rob, uh, let me go to you, and you can, you can respond to, to that as you wish. But, but uh, you know, one, just on the political side of things, one, I think, uh, clear advantage that something like a clean tax cut has over a carbon tax is Carbon tax has tax in the name, right? Tax right. is bad. We don't like right. it. Clean tax cut has tax cut in the name. That's good. Um, but uh, are either of these, you know, if we're talking about the Trump administration, are, aren't both of these kind of uh, political long shots? And then, uh, you know, anything else you want to respond to? Um, well, first, I read, Amer I, I read American Sign Language, and the interpreter just signed. This is the driest panel <laughs> they've had all day. <laughs> Um, well, I, I want to say one thing. P Peter's a friend. Yeah. We, we've known each other for five years, maybe, and we communicate a lot outside of Earth Day, Texas. And I can, I, I'm optimistic that something's going to happen. Um, I, I'm, ver I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, an, a tax cut in the energy sector will happen in this Congress. But if that happens, a large part of the credit is going to go to Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I, there is not an office I've gone on the Hill where the congressman, whether the person's out there on climate or say, no, I can't talk about that, they are very complimentary about Citizens Climate Lobby and the way they conduct business, come in, share the facts and figures, and you know, make, them make their ask for, for um, continuing dialogue. So thank you. Um, I, I want one other, one other problem, I think, with the carbon tax, and we saw this in November, the state of Washington had the first ever carbon tax uh, on its ballot. It was an initiative. So this was the voters putting this in. This wasn't the legislature. Um, but we saw two of the largest left of center environmental groups oppose it. And they opposed it because the revenue was going to offset taxes. It wasn't going to be sent back to some of their progressive part coalition partners. And, and so I, I think that, that's one of the political issues with the carbon tax. Um, but I think we've seen in the last uh, couple of weeks, there's been some new names added to the White House um, who are, are, are climate change realists, um, who have spoken about carbon tax in the past. Uh, you're seeing the, I, you know, you read the papers like I do, you're, you're seeing kind of the balance of power shift from one part to um, Mr. Tr President Trump's son-in-law and daughter and others who seem to be more mainstream. So I, I, I'm very optimistic. Um, it's, uh, the problem with any of the policy, tax policy, is in Congress because it only takes one or two senators to squash anything going on. So. All right, Rod, uh, let's go to you, and uh, you can respond to what's been said uh, previously. But also, you know, uh, isn't the clean tax cut uh, uh, this idea Sim, you know, we've, we've already ha used the tax code uh, to send a lot of money towards renewable energy. You have the production tax credit. There's been other sorts of uh, tax credits. Um, and so it, it, isn't this just kind of a uh, – is the, is the clean tax cut idea just kind of a retread of that? And related to that, another thing that you hear a lot, I think, uh, from, from right of center folks is they don't like the idea of picking winners and losers, right? Uh, it's not the government's job. It's you know the government should uh, uh, be structuring the market right, and then let everything shake itself out. So, is the Clinton tax cut concept just another latest iteration of picking winners and losers? No, 
<laughs> not I at all. <laughs> uh, it's not. So uh, no, the um, first of all, you have to understand that that uh, to go back to tax credits for a second. Most tax credits are price support subsidies, right? They, 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 this, this goes back to the fundamental difference between capital acceleration and a price support subsidy. You're, you're, supri you're supporting the price of a company. You know, you're, you're, you're paying the government, the taxpayers paying more to the company so that it covers their costs. That company wouldn't otherwise be able to make uh, a profit or stay in business. That's that's where you would use a subsidy. If, if you wanted to support that activity. So you're supporting a failing business. With a tax rate cut, it is impossible to support a failing business because the only companies that can take advantage of a tax rate cut are those that are profitable, right? So you don't support any failures. That's why capital tax rate cuts have dynamic growth properties and tax support subsidies have dynamic loss properties. So when you change one for the other, you're, you're doing a policy arbitrage where you're getting rid of the, the dynamic loss properties for a dynamic growth property. That means you can afford more of the claim tax cuts than the, the, than the tax credits. It has very interesting characteristics in that sense. So it's a different paradigm and it's not the same thing. A lot of people confuse them, but that's because they don't quite understand those. You know, the, I mean, the most common mistake I get is people say, Oh, uh, what is that about the clean tax credits? And it's not clean tax credits, it's clean tax cuts, particularly clean tax capital rate cuts. But picking winners and losers, you know, if you cut taxes evenly across the board, you're picking winners and losers because who, the people you're picking as the winners are the free riders, the people who are polluting, right? And, and you know who they are, so you're, you're kind of deliberately doing that, and everybody else is paying the cost. And I think all of us on this panel recognize that fact. So there's no such thing as not picking winners and losers. Uh, and, you know, the carbon tax picks losers. Uh, you know, they pick the fossil fuel as they're, okay, we're, go we're going to say the free, ri we're going to make the free riders the losers. <laughs> so th that's, that's, uh, that's fine, and, then, and everybody else is kind of the winner. Uh, clean Tax Cut says, we're going to try to avoid picking winners and losers as much as possible by picking metrics instead. We're going to pick metrics of sustainability. And in fact, we're not even going to pick climate change. We're not even going to pick carbon because it's clean tax cuts, not carbon tax cuts. Clean tax cuts can really be applied to things like ocean plastics. They can be applied to other problems as well, all kinds of pollution problems. So it, it, it is a kind of a broader concept that's looking at the problem of externalities in general. We have focused a lot on climate change because that's probably the biggest ne uh, negative externality facing us currently, but others might be facing us very soon that are even bigger, like the water problems that we are soon going to be experiencing. So, um, you know, so the, but if you, if you pick winners and losers, if you pick metrics, you can avoid that. Last thing, you mentioned about simplicity uh, of solutions. I think that we have a set of very, very simple solutions that we have come up with through this charrette process. We have challenged our charrette participants to make those solutions as simple, practical, and as effective as possible. I think they've done a really interesting and good job of doing that. And we are publicly announcing uh, those solutions for the first time tomorrow at the Clean Capitalism Forum in the Automotive Building. Uh, we'll be working, announcing those from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. We're going to be doing power sector, uh, green bonds, and clean tech in the morning. And we will be doing uh, oil and gas, forestry and agriculture, real estate. Uh, Steve Nadell is here. And uh, what's the other one? Um, Did you say transportation? Transportation. That's right. Josiah. Josiah is going to tell us all about, you know, the, the details of uh, in the transportation sector in the afternoon. So if you want to hear some really great and interesting new ideas about how to accelerate capital, you can judge for yourselves how complicated it is to do this. I don't think it's that complicated. You know, just one last comment in terms of simplicity. You know, yeah, you know, upstream taxing carbon is a very simple idea. But you know what? 
A dugout canoe is a simple idea too. And it took a long time for us to go from the dugout canoe uh, to the America's Cup 48, which is a sailboat that, that does 48 knots in a 16 knot wind because it's, it's so efficiently designed that it minimizes drag and maximizes lift uh, to the point where you can sail faster than the wind. Uh, and that all comes from design, which is not exactly simple. Designing good policy takes work. And doing something that's super simple isn't necessarily going to give you the best results. You have to design it well. All right. Well, uh, so we're out of time, but thank you uh, to all the panelists uh, for uh, uh, engaging uh, discussion. Thank you. I think thanks to the audience for sitting audience, through it. Yes, yeah. <laughs>